Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. We are on the seventh day of the EU India People Summit. This is our last panel for the day, and this panel is on platform regulation. Now. Today, the tech companies are the richest corporations in the world. This rise has been exponential since the financial market crash, crash of 2008 and 9. And in the last 10 years, we have not only seen the beautiful face of tech in helping us connect and making the world and memories more flat, but we have also seen the worst of it. And the tech has changed not only how we share, speak, and understand the information around us, but also what we as a society share, speak, and understand. We have come to a point rather quickly that there have been calls around the world to shut down Facebook, shut down WhatsApp, shut down Twitter. So amongst all these problems that we have seen in exploding in the tech world in just a 10 years time span, which is rather less, given the history of all the other industrial enterprises and industrial businesses growing. I have with me few very prominent lawyers from different domains across the world to come together and sit and talk with you on how the platforms can be regulated, what else can we do, and what is needed to ensure that this regulation is across the world in a very transnational setting within which the cyberspace operates. So first off, I have with me Karuna. Karuna Nandi is a prominent lawyer from India. Her area of practice focuses on constitutional law, corporate law, and more lately media law and policies. Nandi has played a significant role in drafting the anti-rape bill after the 2012 Delhi gang raid, which also shook the conscience of the entire world. In 2019, Karuna was appointed by the UK Foreign Office to, pa to panel of experts to develop legal frameworks to protect freedom of media across the globe. Karuna has also advised and worked on policy issues across the countries in South Asia. So welcome Karuna. Then I have with me Rita Jabri Markwell. Rita is a lawyer based in Australia and she is working with the Aman Foundation, which is Australian Muslim Advocacy Network, a, a national body working to secure the physical and psychological safety of Australian Muslims through research and policy development. Rita is leading the organization's engagement with tech industry and researchers, as well as its contribution to law and policy reform in Australia. In conjunction with, with Birch Grove Legal, Aman began with an investigation into Facebook's reporting tool earlier this year, and more recently, she has taken Facebook to court on anti-discrimination and Islamophobia. More on that from Rita in a while. Then I have with me Maha Rafiatal, an academic researcher who I pulled in from another panel. Uh, you have seen Maha today moderating a wonderful panel on corporate social responsibilities and business responsibilities. And uh, uh, Maha, as you know, is working on the intersection of business and international affairs, focusing on how multinational corporations acquire political power, how they exercise it, and how they can be held accountable. And finally, I have with me Aisha Bhandari, who is the Deputy Director of ACLU Speech, Privacy and Technology Project, where she works on litigation and advocacy to protect freedom of expression and privacy rights in the digital age. Aisha has focused on the impact of big data and artificial intelligence on civil liberties. She has litigated cases, including Santik versus Barr, a First Amendment challenge to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and Al Saud versus Wolf, a challenge to suspicionless electronic device searches at the US borders. So welcome you all. And I am rather proud to have uh, with me such strong female lawyers from across the world sitting in this panel. So I am in some ways very proud because this is perhaps the first and only panel in the summit, which is completely female. So uh, having said that, uh, Rita, I would like to start with you from what you have done in, in Australia more recently with the Facebooks, uh, the, uh, with the litigation against Facebooks. Yes, Rita, please walk us through. Thank you, Rito, and what an, I'm just so uh, happy to be amongst this company. Um, thank you for organizing the EU, you know, India People's Summit. This is amazing. 
Um, yeah, so in Australia, uh, we have a discrimination framework. We have hate speech laws um, and our discrimination framework at the federal level provides protection um, on the basis of race, ethnicity, uh, national origin, and when it comes to discrimination, also immigrant status. Uh, so we've uh, uh, been using that as a framework to um, engage with Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Facebook, this has been going on for more than a year, um, and uh, we have been, I suppose, monitoring their platform to see how well they enforce um, their, their own policies um, and keeping them abreast of the failures to moderate, um, using that as a way to engage, to fact find, uh, to problem solve with them directly on, I suppose, what we would call like inside track advocacy. Um, and given that um, hasn't really produced the outcomes that um, we, you know, we, we sought in a, in a specific time frame. Um, we, are, we have escalated things uh, through the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, which ultimately may lead us to the, you know, federal court here in Australia. Um, and the, the, the crux of the argument um, is that they have placed an unreasonable burden upon uh, the Muslim, uh, all the ethnic minorities that make up the Muslim community here in Australia um, by uh, requiring us to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to documenting violations uh, and um, so, so that they will then take action on pages and groups and, um, and also that they are liable for the hate speech that is in many of these pages and groups which um, operate under the guise, very thinly veiled guise of being anti-Islam or uh, counter jihad, um, but actually have quite significant amounts of dehumanization of uh, racial and ethnic minorities in them. Thanks a lot, uh, Rita. I will come in the next round to you on the aspect of dehumanization particularly, but before that, I want to move on to Aisha, who has also, in the past, led a litigation against Facebook. So Aisha, can you walk us through the ad targeting litigation, please? Yes, um, it's so interesting to be on this panel with all of you. So interesting to hear, Rita, the work that you're doing. I think uh, probably, you know, many, people uh, watching this are familiar that with the fact that the U.S. legal regime is quite different from other countries in the sense of having very strong protections in the First Amendment for freedom of speech. Um, and so our focus at the ACLU has been not so much on encouraging platforms, um, you know, to further moderate um, user content. Um, and, and I can talk about that separately, but, um, you know, our, our focus has been on actions that the platforms are taking themselves that have discriminatory outcomes or impact. And uh, one big area, of course, is their um, decisions on how to target ad content to people. Um, you know, the, the, the Facebook litigation that we brought was about the infrastructure that Facebook had created where advertisers for housing opportunities, job opportunities, credit opportunities, could specify who sees their ads. Um, and I'm sure, uh, you know, most of the panelists represented here uh, are from countries where there are certain civil rights protections that say you cannot target, say, job ads based on race, religion, ethnicity, national origin, gender, age, what we call in the United States protected class status. And so uh, what was happening was that advertisers could go on Facebook and they could just say, show my job ad for an engineer to men only. Uh, you know, show my nursing ad um, only to people of a certain age range, right? And, and that is against the law. Um, and the problem was that prior to this litigation, I think, you know, platforms would have taken the position that that's not our responsibility. If an advertiser chooses to make those discriminatory targeting decisions, um, of course, our argument was you provide the option, right? The advertiser can't identify user's age, gender, race, and the advertiser can't deliver those ads. It is Facebook that is doing all of this. Facebook that has the data it is collecting on people's identities and Facebook that is delivering that. Um, so we settled that case um, and we got major changes to the platform. So 
in the United States now, if you are placing an ad for housing, employment, or credit, um, you as an advertiser are not given those targeting options anymore. Um, and you know that was just the first step though. We recognize that there's a lot more to do. First of all, Facebook is just one platform. So the other platforms that offer advertising have to do this. And, and our goal is to push forward with that. But the second thing is it's not just explicit targeting that's happening because we know that platforms use their own internal algorithms to decide who to show certain content to, right? And they can, um, you know, even if, I, if I'm an advertiser and I never choose to target based on gender, age, race, religion, um, you know, the data maximization algorithms that the platforms are using could still have this effect and only show it, you know, to certain people that they think are interested and replicate existing biases in society, right? So if they think only men are interested in certain jobs, the algorithm might show that ad disproportionately to men. And I think this ties in a little bit with what Rita was saying about content moderation as well, where, uh, you know, while we don't um, encourage greater moderation of user speech, we do think that the platforms um, do have to interrogate their own algorithms and the choices they make to amplify certain content over others, because there's a lot more going on than simply users posting online. Um, the platforms do a lot of uh, behind the scenes, opaque work, to, you know, to sort of shape the experience that a user has, and they have a lot of control over that. So I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Aisha. And this kind of like covers two of the very important points that we are seeing in, in the platform economy, one of which is to the discriminatory speech itself, or rather disinformation and discriminatory speech. The second issue uh, pertains to the privacy of the data and ad targeting because you can monopolize data and surveillance capitalism, what we have come to know at. And the third issue is pretty much related to the size of these companies itself, the, the monopolies that they have created. So here I would like to invite Maha because Maha has been looking in these companies, monopolies, how they went on to create them and how they project themselves. So Maha, please. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for having me um, on this on this panel. I guess um, I'd like to draw kind of two things from my research. The first is is actually, you know, what you um, what you pointed to, right, that that, um, you know, we can talk about how to tweak, um, you know, the behavior of these platforms at the margin, but the fundamental problem is that they're just too large. Um, and uh, they just have an outside influence um, in a whole variety of you know areas of life, including obviously you know what this this panel is is interested in um, you know sort of their influence in in kind of digital democracy and our public debate and so on. Um, and you know there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, so in my research, I've been looking at um, the ways in which um, a lot of our regulatory apparatus um, and the and the the paper that I've published about this so far is very much focused on the U.S., but I have um, work underway that's looking at kind of platform issues um, in in other institutional contexts. Um, that you know our regulatory apparatus is based very much on um, the idea that companies sit in a particular sector or a particular market. Right, and then we can calculate. I mean, this is this is, should be really, really blunt. We can calculate like what percentage of that market they're in, and then when companies merge with other companies, we can add up their market share and decide whether they're going to cross some kind of monopoly threshold. And in almost every country, this is how antitrust, you know, sort of legislation works. Um, the platform companies, and this is often true with with new companies, um, sit depending how you look at them in enough different sectors um, that they can make themselves look smaller than they are. Um, in the way that they present, right, who their competitors are and what market they want to sit in. And so in my research, I show that they do this quite deliberately. Um, and, and on top of that, because of the way they sit in different markets, they're able to leverage their position doing one thing um, in order to scale up their access to something else. So the most obvious one is all of the platforms that sell products um, are often selling those products on marketplaces that they themselves control, right? So when you search for um, you know, UGG boots on Amazon, the first result will not be UGG brand boots. It will be boots that look like UGG boots, but that are actually Amazon made, right? They're pushing their own um, products that you. So part of the research is about, okay, what are we gonna do about that? And to some extent, the solution to those problems is that you will eventually have to break these companies up. Um, and, and, you know, to the point of this sort of, of this summit, actually India is way out in front um, on these issues because India has adopted a policy um, that says that you cannot be selling your own products in a marketplace that you control. Um, I think that we should expect there to be post COVID litigation about that um, and for India to then become the test case for whether this kind of structural separation um, can be imposed. 
Um, but the second piece I think that is relevant to kind of this conversation about hate speech and sort of extremist content um, and what we can do about it um, is that these one of the kind of like dualities that these companies straddle is they're private companies, right? They're for profit private entities. Um, but because of the particular business that they're in, they host a big chunk of our public political debate. Um, and so they straddle this kind of public private status um, that they're also able to leverage in both directions. So on the one hand, if told, you know, you should have some responsibility for the content, the companies are very quick to say, look, we're just private companies, right? We're just platforms, we're not responsible. But on the other hand, if government steps in and tries to regulate that content, they're very quick to say, this is regulating political debate, this is regulating democracy, this is censorship, you can't do that. Um, and so they want, when it's convenient, right, to be public and when it's convenient to be private. Um, and that, I think, is the tension that's maybe the most relevant, um, you know, to, to this problem. Um, and it's, you know, and it's an interesting tension that they're wrestling with in some ways in the U.S. context. So obviously, we're having this conversation this week. Uh, the Facebook Oversight Board has just issued this decision about the decision to remove Trump. Um, and at the very extreme level, right, waiting until basically the end of the presidency when there, you know, was an attempted coup, that's the threshold for, okay, somebody gets banned um, in the U.S. But globally, these concerns have been getting raised, right, in a lot of places, including very specifically in India, um, in ways where when it's convenient, they say we're just private companies, we're not responsible for, you know, hate groups that are organizing. And then when it's convenient to say, if you regulate us, this is censorship, because we're actually the public sphere, we represent some kind of public actor. Um, and so that I think has to be resolved one way or other for any regulatory approach to work. Very rightly said, Sir Maha, and I'm pretty sure we will come to this point again uh, during the panel. Karuna, I wanted to move to you because you have worked both in the antitrust as well as the free speech domain, and you are based in India. <laughs> and I'm hoping that you will perhaps someday take Facebook to court within India, if that's possible. So Karuna, over to you. <laughs> We can't hear you, you have to understand it. I'm very pleased to be on this panel, in part because I also think that we need a lot more uh, cross-border collaboration when we bring cases. We need forum shop better, we need to strategize better, and we need to target better. There are times that we need to bring cases across jurisdictions, um, either simultaneously or sequentially. So hello, everyone, and I hope that we all stay in touch. Um, Look, the problem that we're dealing with is a behemoth problem. We've been talking about it for years. We've been talking about how the size of these companies are, uh, is, is massive, that there are huge competition problems, that uh, there are huge monopoly problems, that, that um, regulation is deeply inadequate on the one hand. On the other hand, there are also so smart people like Daphne Keller that say that we shouldn't overemphasize regulation because then we have private actors engaging in huge amounts of um, censorship, malfeasance, um, and other kinds of violations, not just of free speech, but of anti -discri but of discrimination laws, right? Keeping in mind, everybody, that in India, we don't have an anti-discrimination law, right? There are these various um, legislations that many of us have been pushing for many years now. Um, but we've got our Article 14 and 19 and 21, which is, you know, the golden triangle of constitutional rights. And so you have a sort of broad chapeau of anti-discrimination constitutional law. So what does it mean in practice? How many people go in writs to a high court? What is your access to justice? Do you have access to even a lawyer? What is the bandwidth of a court in a population that is so large? What do you do when a government consistently acts unconstitutionally against free speech, against minorities, and against, indeed, they, you know, when we speak of monopolistic practices, there's also the huge problem of completely opaque campaign funding. And while this may seem like it's a little bit far from the topic under discussion, it's absolutely not. Because in India, electoral bonds are 
bonds that private corporations, including foreign corporations, can buy and fund the ruling party. And the government refuses to tell us that we have a right to know who they are. Forget regulation. We don't even have a right to know who they are. So let me talk a little bit about the, and as I think somebody else on the panel mentioned that these are tinkering, these sort of litigations are tinkering around the edges because these companies are deciding to a significant extent who we vote for, what we buy and who we love, who we hate, who we kill. And that's not okay, right? So when people speak of Okay, froze for a minute, sorry. So when people speak of shutting down Facebook, uh, a platform that I am still on, but I use like Twitter, um, I use like I use it like Twitter because I presume that you know all my information is going to be public. Um, I think that that should some be something that's very much on the table, right? In, co in, in advocacy, thinking about actually shutting companies like Facebook down. The reason that it's only, that I think it should only be on the table and not something that we can um, unambiguously call for is because for some people, Facebook is the internet. When there was the whole campaign for net neutrality in India and when there was a huge lobbying for free basics to be, um, at, you know, to be available in a different way. And because a lot of people just do have Facebook and that's, that, that's the internet for them. Um, that part of it is true, right? With regard to the litigation I've been involved in and the efforts that we've had, um, I do a fair amount of tech work, <laughs> by the way. Um, so years ago, I mean, it feels like years ago, 2015, I was involved in the first, I think, big case that looked at platform regulation, right? Intermediary liability, website blocking, as well as the taking down of Section 66A, which is the which was the provision in the uh, Information Technology Act, which, at the lowest threshold, criminalized all information online that was annoying or inconvenient. And what was annoying or inconvenient was not defined anywhere. And um, the potential penalty was three years. So your local constable, uh, it was a cognizable offense. So your local constable got to decide whether the, your neighbor's complaint that your mass message was annoying or inconvenient is something that you should be arrested for immediately. This is, honestly, we didn't challenge it before because I thought it was too stupid that, you know, and it was in the draft form, we thought that this is not going to pass. Um, when it came on the books, one thought that it's going to be one of those vestigial laws that never get used, right? And then it was used, and it was used a lot. Um, and it was used against a professor, Ambikesh Mahapatra, who we were advising, um, who put out a cartoon of, and it's not just the Modi government, though they were amongst the most offenders, a cartoon of Mamta Banerjee is completely inoffensive. I'm being godly and I could tell, you know, it's, and still, it was still, you know, even that funny to be honest. And um, he sent it to his housing group and somebody outside of the housing group, a political party activist made a complaint because local standard wasn't made clear in that law either. And he was then arrested for his own quote unquote protection, right? Um, and then there was a case, and then there was a proper criminal case. What we got in Shreya Singhal seemed great at the time. We were looking to not have over censorship by private actors um, because every legal notice seemed to result in a takedown. Um, we got an order saying that it is only a court order that would result in a takedown. But something that I was pushing for, um, and not a lot of people agreed with at the time, was that I did feel that there has to be a structure within 
the large intermediary, obviously not the small intermediary, you know, me and my Facebook page or me and my WordPress page or whatever. But I did feel that there has to be a structure within the large intermediary which has an, which has an appeals process, right? Um, because otherwise you can't always have the onus on the woman whose naked pictures are online to go to court or even indeed the child who, um, on whose behalf the state might, the state would have to go to court. So we got protection for these intermediaries uh, and a safe harbor in terms of website blocking. We got an order for some transparency that there should be reasons should be given. And the biggest victory at the time was the striking down of the setting aside of section 66A. Since then, of course, what we've seen in terms of Facebook's behavior and the behavior of a lot of these intermediaries is, I mean, we saw in neighboring Myanmar, the role of Facebook in the Rohingya massacre. But more recently also, we have seen with the huge controversy around the position of the policy head at Facebook and her closeness to the ruling party and her failure to, um, despite internal requests, to take down speech that was incitement to violence and arguably incitement to genocide, right, against Muslims, is, um, very important because what it shows us because it's only a little small little metronym of what's actually going on right because in terms of proximity to power and let's face it regardless of what this of the facebook oversight uh, oversight board says and i like them some of them are my friends i have huge respect for them i like the orders that they've come up with Ultimately, it's Mark Zuckerberg that decides what his platform is going to do, right? And if you can stay open in a country, and do you care what happens in a tin pot little developing country far from California? Do you care that much what's even going on in California or the rest of the United States, right? Should it be up to how much you care? Is that really is that really the only limit there is? So I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up so that we can have a conversation about this stuff. Um, but I think that we're up against something that's incredibly we're up against a huge problem. And it's true that regulation is always behind tech. But here I think that we've been left behind in sort of the medieval age. Uh, thanks a lot, Karuna, for that intervention. It kind of like uh, puts me to, uh, to that information ethics uh, uh, space where uh, Professor Floridi from uh, uh, from Oxford University, he talks about that we are in sort of like a hybrid space of which is real and cyber at the same time. And we need to move along in this direction because we are not either moving back or not moving too far forward, which is sort of our problem going forward. And what also comes from Aisha talking about the artificial, um, uh, the algorithm, sorry, and uh, uh, Maha talking about the size of these massive companies. And let me take just a step backward and just like uh, think of it uh, with all of you on, on this, particular aspect of the public political nature of these platforms. And we have seen that in US very recently, we have seen that unfolding in, I was doing a study in Netherlands and we have seen that unfolding also in Netherlands. We have seen how the platform was used to garner the right-wing extreme parties into position of power. We have seen that, as you said, from Anki Das's statement in India. We have seen that also, also perhaps in Australia. So where do we as lawyers, as uh, advocates in our own jurisdictions draw the line? Where do we as researchers like Maha is here? Uh, sorry, Maha is the only one who's not lawyer amongst us. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure she's very well aware of the platform regulations and the business uh, antitrust regulations, nevertheless. Uh, so where do we draw the line? Do we have a line at all in any of the jurisdictions around? So. Uh, Anyone who would like to take this first? Aisha, perhaps? There we go. 
Well, I, I think it's, I, I'm, I've been really interested to hear all the issues everyone has raised because one of the things we often talk about, you know, in my context is just how easy it is to identify the problems and how hard it is to have solutions. And I think this is something we struggle with a lot. And um, one example, I think Karuna alluded to this is that, um, you know, we are very loath given the increasing trends of many governments worldwide towards greater authoritarianism and censorship instincts to suggest that that is the answer. And I think, you know, it's, it's obvious why, right? Um, these, what, one of the issues is these are platforms that operate worldwide. That's part of their power and their monopoly power. It's not just concentrated in one country, it's truly worldwide. And that comes with several downsides, um, some upsides as well, but one of the downsides that has been identified is lack of cultural context, lack of understanding of, you know, um, what speech uh, in certain contexts would mean. And so an inability to even moderate that with any um, expertise, knowledge, or context. Um, and two, you know, a vulnerability perhaps to government pressure um, to be able to operate in certain countries to censor things that are um, antithetical to that government's interests. And that's, and, and with the results that, you know, it might be that the largest platforms might censor only in certain countries, but some might decide it's easier to censor around the world, right? So criticism of particular governments, if, if, you, if you're not allowed to post that on a particular country, maybe it's easier to just say nobody in the world can see those criticisms of those perfect, of those, of those governments. It's just better for us to have a universal rule. That's a really tough problem. And I, I don't know uh, what a good answer to that is when you've got hundreds of countries in the world that might be interested in imposing their own censorship regimes, some more liberal, some less. Um, so that's one problem I, I think we grapple with a lot. And then the other one is, you know, I think when we talk about the algorithms and the platform's own choices, it's clear at this point that extremist content, clickbait, whatever you want to call it, makes more money for them. And so we can't really separate the choices that they're making, regardless of the lip service that any particular platform pays to human rights or we're democratizing force and we want to give people what they want and we give people their own voice. But they're making choices that maximize their 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 income, their money, the, the money that they make. Whether it's uh, you know extremist content that more people click on, whether it's using various techniques of pushing content to people, um, we know they have very sophisticated algorithms and tools to do this. And so I think we also have to um, sort of look you know look beyond just the 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 paying lip service to um, you know broader principles and issues and really examine. Um, you know, how do we address this problem that the platforms make money in some ways, the more uh, controversial or extremist the, act, the actions that they promote? Aisha, uh, Aisha, you pointed out a very interesting point over here. And uh, from our own study in the Dutch elections, uh, we did find out that the platforms over a period of three months, they made 300,000 euros from just one political party for pushing disinformation on Corona. So yeah, so the COVID, uh, COVID disinformation alone uh, earns them that much money. So this is going to be on the on their table soon. Let's see how they react to it. I'm looking at the, I'm going to uh, see some squirmish faces then. Uh, uh, bring coming to you, Rita, because you have also done a lot of uh, platform moderation as well, and uh, you know you have actually gone uh, after Facebook on this whole principle of the politicalness of the platform, which is leading to further discrimination of certain minority groups in Australia and not just in Australia, everywhere in the world. So, Rita, please. Yeah, look, I think it's. Uh... Just to pick up what was been what has just been said, there are a lot of vulnerabilities worldwide in terms of current democracies, which are exacerbated by social media um, and taken advantage of by social media, but also where people and minority groups benefit from having social media because finally, you know, in some cases we have a voice and can be heard. So um, I, I totally, I'm very also a strong supporter of freedom of expression in that regard. Um, in Australia, we do have a, a quite a good situation in the sense that a lot of hate speech is not mainstreamed the way it is in other countries. Um, dehumanisation hasn't been mainstreamed in our political discourse the same way it has been in, you know, UK, India, 
um, where people have actually referred to minority groups as cockroaches and dogs. And uh, it, we've, we've had, you know, small, very small amounts of it, very fringe amounts of it, but it's still in terms of the Overton window, you know, what political scientists refer to, it's very much at the, yeah, at the perimeter. And our goal is to try and keep it at the perimeter um, and to make sure that we aren't dragged down, you know, um, down this drain. So uh, we will use hate speech laws and discrimination laws to, to push back as hard as we can. In terms of internationally, what platforms, are, you know, pushing towards some sort of global consensus, I think the strongest, one of the strongest roads has to be around mandating transparency, especially in regards to their algorithms. Uh, and that will help us to also know about the decisions that are made um, on the bequest of governments uh, to censor particular things or to, you know, um, uh, allow certain disinformation campaigns or dehumanisation campaigns to continue. Uh, I would love to see that transparency. And uh, I'd also love to see, um, you know, the Rome Statute in terms of incitement to genocide um, having, um, you know, really protected status as an international customary law legal norm that we, uh, that platforms have to, must stand by, particularly when it comes to dehumanisation and not, and having zero tolerance for dehumanisation campaigns, regardless of who it comes from, whether it's state sponsored or an extremist movement. So Rita, just stopping you there, because I told you earlier that I would really like you to also, you know, speak out the definition that you uh, use for the litigation on dehumanization, because uh, as we discussed in one of the earlier panels uh, with you, uh, this was much more uh, uh, thought uh, with a great thought that this definition was developed, which was much more broader and more detailed than what the UN or the European Council has come with. So please. Yeah, so we did a study last year um, of uh, five actors on Facebook and Twitter that were using disinformation uh, to create an aggregate harm of dehumanization. And this is the thing, you know, our platforms are will like to um, assess one piece of evidence at a time, but we were wondering what is the framework that they would use to assess a pattern of behavior over time. Um, and um, the dehumanization uh, definitions that we've come up with uh, sort of draw on um, a genocide prevention research, um, you know, so it's dehumanising language, things that we all, most people know about, uh, speaking, referring to um, classes of persons as subhumans, mechanically inhuman, uh, supernatural threats. Um, and by subhuman, we're talking about insects, disease, filth, um, um, animals. Uh, but the um, other thing which we have we think is really important is that we have tried to encapsulate dis dehumanizing discourse uh, through disinformation and defining, you know, in re readily apparent ways, what, how that is carried out and what are the predictors that you can use in any context to um, say, yeah, that's actually an information campaign that is designed to dehumanize that protected group over time. Uh since you, you're encouraging us to intervene, Ritumbra, I think, Rita, that that's an incredibly important piece of work that you're doing because I found in my free speech communities that before, and particularly in the United States, before uh, the Trump administration, that there was, there was a serious lack of understanding of hate speech, right? and the impact that it could have. I also think that there's, um, of course, I and mean, I think part of the problem is, and I, you know, is that a lot of the free speech community then in the United States was a lot of white guys, okay? The First Amendment people, there were a lot of white guys then. Um, but at the same time, um, I think that's changing. And something that I've been pushing for for a long, long time and ha is happening very little is to understand what the, you know, to, to understand as empirically as possible what the impact is of hate speech, right? Because let's be clear that at the international level, Article 22, 20 Part 2 of the ICCPR is quite clear. 
it's that speech that is that arouses um, not just incitement and discrimination, but also hostility. Which some people think is too low a standard, right? But lots of lots of sort of special rapporteurs and others have clarified is a sort of deep structural hostility is something that should be limited or grounds on which speech can be limited. So I think that the sort of and we know that speech has an impact. And I think this is this is something that as communities that work on free speech and balance that against, or not balance that, but you know, understand what the limits are with regard to hate speech, must really sort of entrench because we know that anti-smoking campaigns work. That's speech. We know that other behavioral change campaigns work. We know that certain kinds of speech can lead to genocide. And it's not just go and kill that person. It starts before death. The ICTR, of course, started it. The Susan Ganesh has done interesting work on it. Um, partly, I think the problem in the US was the repackaging of hate speech into dangerous speech because people want, you know, people used to hear hate speech and switch off. Um, so I do feel that the work you're doing in terms of is it, is it, or have I misunderstood it? Is it empirical? But I think that across the world that we need more of this. Just to clarify, our study is not an empirical study yet, um, but it's, we are inputting. You're asking the right question. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got a framework which we're looking to put into an empirical, um, to, to, to subject to a much greater sample size so we can test it. Yeah, great. Uh, on that note, I I was, uh, Karuna, you meant, mentioned about the anti-smoking campaign and perhaps Maha can also jump in uh, on this question because when we had across the world these anti-smoking campaigns or rather anti-smoking labels on the cigarette packs, there was certain clear legislative framework behind it to tell the companies that you have to say what the outcomes are. Can we, do you see any parallels that can emerge in coming years or can we push uh, platforms towards having that sort of responsibility? Do we need to have a legal push towards them saying that, you know, the drip, drip, drip effect of hate on your platforms is causing hatred? So can we expect Facebook to say that, oh yeah, welcome here, but you might get doctrinated towards a hate mentality or <laughs> whatever, so Maha, please. Yeah, I, I think this question really speaks to, um, you know, we're talking about different kinds of companies, right? I mean, the, the model that you're talking about with tobacco, you know, I mean, these are companies that sell a very specific product um, and where the disclosure is to the customer who is buying that product. Um, neither of those things is true of platform companies, right? First of all, they don't have one product. They have right all these different products in different markets as part of the regulatory problem. Um, and two, nobody who is using their Facebook account as a customer. That's not who the customer is, right? You do not have a relationship as a customer with this company. Um, and, and because of that, you know, anything around consumer protection where, you know, if I buy a product from a company, they have an obligation not to defraud me, not to steal my credit card info, not to lie to me about what's in the product, right? All of those things are part of the attachments that they have as a result of I'm entering into a contract with them when I purchase something. Um, you have no relationship institutionally at all with Facebook that like commercial regulatory law is capable of grabbing in that way. Um, and that's just a fundamental problem um, with these platforms. The closest we've come to that and the exception to this, and, and, I, and I think it's sort of interesting that way, um, is the model that the EU has set with GDPR. Because the thing about GDPR is that they are making a claim to regulate on behalf of the interests of the users um, and they're trying to regulate companies that, that aren't, you know, headquartered in an EU jurisdiction, right? I mean, the application is if you serve a website in the EU to anybody in the EU, even if that person enters into no transactional relationship with you at all by like entering your web address into Google, uh, you are still obligated to comply with this regulation. Um, and that's like really a new uh, frontier, but it's the closest thing to what you're talking about in terms of a disclosure that exists on a website. Um, and, you know, it's, 
I think that's a closer model to the kind of thing you're describing than the plain packaging thing, because we're talking about like a very different kind of company and a very different kind of product. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Maha, for that intervention. And indeed, it's uh, it has been said repeatedly that for Facebook, we are the products, right? Because our information is on sale, which is where the GDPR debate also comes in and the entire regulatory framework for privacy comes in as well. Uh, I do see a couple of questions and I see one raised hand of Anuband, who's perhaps the only- I just, sorry. Can I yeah, just, um, I just yeah. want to clarify, because there are a couple of legal actions happening internationally on the consumer protection law basis. So I'm not sure that the jury is out on the whole point of us not being uh, in a relationship, in a legal consumer relationship. The U uh, France and US, there are proceedings afoot. So I think it's an alive question. Uh, and, and I will, I, I want to jump in there Tate, and say, um, I think I, I agree it's an, it's an open question and particularly in the context where data is being collected because of the fact that you have either engaged with a platform or visited. Um, of course, with Facebook and Twitter and other platforms that you make accounts, I think there's even a stronger argument there. What's tricky of course is, yeah, when you're talking about like Google, right? Google is also, you know, search engines that you're um, using that are collecting your information, but you're not necessarily even in that, um, you know, account creation or, or that relationship, but nonetheless, they're only getting your information by dint of you visiting their service, right? So I think there's a lot of um, well, open questions there Well, but then there's also like you visit some random website, you go to the New York Times, yes. you read the news yes. article, the New York Times ad tracker is not run by the New York Times, right? They right. contract with Google to run that. So you have entered into no relationship even informally with Google, that your data is just going right. Yeah. So, it, yeah. like, it's it it is difficult. I think um, yeah. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's not quite the same as a label on a tobacco packet. Yes, um, it's I, just I not agree quite with that. As direct as that. Yeah. yeah. I, yes, I totally agree, and I also think it's it's something that will be interrogated probably in the coming months because it is this open question and and whether the line will be drawn on whether okay when you visit the. New York Times website, are you their customer? But what is the relationship to their third party trackers? Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, and I think that these are some of the questions which are already being discussed as we are also discussing in this panel. And I hope that we are able to find answers to that collectively or uh, the outside of this panel as well. And one of the other things was that in Australia, like recently they had this uh, a whole set of litigation of uh, Facebook uh, not paying the news agencies, Facebook and Google, but then being, being used as a news agency. And this is something that we are also seeing that Facebook is a source of news. Google has already a Google News. Right, so in some ways there's this direct consumer relationship, at least in terms of information relationship. So, uh, so yeah, um, these are, of course, the difficult question and we will continue to explore it. Uh, anu, uh, please go ahead and uh, ask your question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Anu, I'm based in Paris and I have two questions. I will read them out. Uh, the first one is EU has an anti-monopoly market policy in place. The recent example of uh, was that of squashing of a possible merger between the two European companies, Siemens and Alstom, the railway sector. While apparently no, and I say apparently because I'm not sure, no such mechanism exists in the USA. And GAFAM, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft being some of the examples of such monopolies, uh, giant companies. Uh, how do you look at it when market regulation happens in one part of the world and not in the other? How do you look at a possible harmonization of this policy, in particular in the context of a uniform social media platform regulations across the globe? Uh, that's my first question. Second question, we already, I already asked this to Akar Patel, who, who came on uh, our show, our uh, discussion, but I would like to see how you respond to it. So both Trump and Kangana were recently banned from Twitter. Trump, in particular, claimed to be the voice of the voiceless. What will happen to that suppressed voice now? How do you look at look at it with the perspective of freedom of expression? Thanks. It's open to anybody. I mean, everybody. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, the 
the, I mean, the lawyers will correct me, but the, I mean, the U.S. does have antitrust and competition law, including provisions to review, uh, you know, mergers in the way that you're talking about. Um, it's much more a case of, um, you know, uh, a change in enforcement practice um, in the U.S. over the last, um, God, how long ago were the 1970s now? A long time, 50 years. I was going to say 30, and that's wrong. Uh, that to step away um, from uh, from that type of enforcement um, as a result of a, a kind of a revolution in legal theory and practice that took place in the late 1970s. Um, so although those laws are still in the books, the way that American regulators enforce them um, has gotten much more cautious around um, around mergers and acquisitions in particular. Um, and in the tech sector, I think you can really see the implications of this in that um, a lot of the large American platform companies have grown by acquisition. There are clearly a number of key acquisitions in the history of these companies that when you look back, um, had those decisions, and, and it's um, it, it's sort of automatic that they go up for a certain kind of review, had the, had the review of those decisions gone differently, um, we wouldn't be in the place that, that we are. Um, so, you know, um, there it's, you know, uh, antitrust law is as much about, you know, how it's enforced and how the enforcement agencies interpret um, their remit as it is about the laws that are actually in the books. But you're right that the EU, um, at least in its current incarnation, has a much more expansive interpretation of, um, of that mandate. Um, in terms of like jurisdiction and what do you do when the companies are someplace and that they operate everywhere and different, you know, kind of governments have different approaches to enforcement. I used to be very pessimistic about, well, the companies are American, American antitrust lawyers uh, have become much more cautious, uh, everybody else is screwed. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, in part because of what's happening in, in India with structural separation, in Australia with some of the things that Rita's talked about, um, and, um, you know, in the EU with GDPR, I do think that we are starting to see that countries that don't host these companies in a strict jurisdictional sense, um, are still able to do things um, in in ways that like there's space being carved out. Um, I think there are limits to how far you can take it if the if US antitrust authorities don't get on board because at the end of the day, if you especially if you're gonna break the companies up, that can only happen in the jurisdictions where they're headquartered. Um, but I do also think that the, um, the pendulum is swinging in the US back in um, a more kind of aggressive enforcement direction. Um, the people who have been appointed to the relevant roles in the current administration are um, pretty hawkish about the big tech companies. Um, so I think we can be kind of cautiously optimistic about that. Thanks a lot, Maha. Uh, I also wanted to join uh, uh, Anu's question with two of the questions that we have on the Q&A because they both uh, are also part of the free speech argument that we are taking here, and uh, which uh, Anu actually alluded to. So the, one of the question is that we, how far can we go hate speech against free speech or uh, hate speech against say minorities and freedom of speech, for example. And the other thing was specifically towards blocks and filters, automated filters against certain illegal content, specifically child pornography. And this is a very strong area that we have seen legislations take shape and at least deliver better than other places, not as good as we would have hoped it to, but we have seen um, this kind of legislations there. So any any of you perhaps uh, would like to jump in or also add to the uh, what Maha said earlier on the antitrust. So please feel free. I'd like to add to what Maha said in terms of antitrust, um, antitrust work that's going on in India. And I completely agree that India is ahead of a lot of other countries on this particular aspect. The difficulty, of course, is that, and the reason we don't see more challenges is because the competition commission that makes these decisions at the first instance takes a really, really long time. And also the fact that they don't, they almost never give stay orders, right? you almost never get an interim order. So if you're an app that's dependent, say, on um, Google Play, or if you are somebody, I mean, there are a variety of players, and you can't really function without that ecosystem, then in the absence of an interim order, um, you're a bit stuck. And it's the problem that you're challenging that, um, makes it impossible to challenge it. 
at the same time, there are companies that have sort of done it, and there's Bharat Matrimony. There are a number of other cases that are um, that have sort of come out of the competition commission and gone up the line. And um, there are some really excellent, well-reasoned judgments against Google, um, citing the emerging jurisprudence from Italy, from other countries, the few sort of judgments that um, have emerged and, and that work is happening. Um, I do think I'm really glad that that you that we're focusing on this aspect of things as well, because usually the free speech people don't talk to the um, antitrust people enough, you know. And I think that thinking about this problem in a holistic way is vital. I agree that I think the free speech people talking to the antitrust people has been a recent development. And I think, you know, in part, I, I, I do think traditionally as a free speech community, we focus on the dangers of government censorship and uh, particularly, you know, government censorship of things that are critical of, of government. But when you've got monopoly power, that's essentially private corporate power. That, that's not a better world to live in, in which three or four companies can decide what is acceptable for anyone in the world to say, um, which of course naturally will lead to pressures to censor speech that's not conducive to their own interests. Does anyone want to take the question about um, Trump being taken down and Kang Na not, and also the, how do we construct what is free speech and what is majoritarian speech and hate speech or what should be there and what shouldn't be there? Should we be the arbiters of truth? I'm happy to talk about the Trump thing briefly, the Trump Twitter ban. I think. One of the, you know, so so when it comes to a politician, right, I think it's not uh, really persuasive to say, well, uh, someone like Trump doesn't have other platforms. In fact, you know, when he was president, he had the biggest platform in the world to get his messages out other than through social media. Um, that is not true for the average user, of course, right? So when we talk about our concern with uh, platforms having the power to permanently ban people, it's it's really, it's it's the regular person who once banned from a social media platform, essentially can't participate in the digital public square, which might mean participating in democracy. And so regardless of you know, what content moderation you do, permanent bans have real implications for people. Um, so when it comes to politicians though, I think there's a different set of factors to consider because one, like I said, they have other outlets. They don't need that outlet to get their message out like the average person might. Um, you have the White House, you have every major media company that will carry your message. On the other hand, um, I think we do need to recognize that there's an importance to people having you know, direct knowledge of what their elected officials are saying and doing, and that it's not necessarily a better world in which your elected officials retreat to some smaller private platform of only their supporters, um, and the rest of the world is not aware of the things that they're doing. And, and one thing you know, I would note is a lot of what Trump posted on Twitter, um, as offensive and horrible as it was, um, was cited by courts in decisions um, ranging from things like the Muslim ban. You know, people looked at his tweets, courts looked at his tweets for evidence of the intent. And in other cases as well, and um, in other human rights cases that were brought, um, courts said, look, we got this direct evidence of what the mindset and the motive of the president was. And so that's another factor to be weighed when you're talking about people who are in positions of prominence and have power and authority over everyone. So Asia, you also bring in a very important part point of the evidence as well in some ways over here by talking about looking into the mind of the perpetrator because this was the problem with the Myanmar tweets get at the Facebook feeds of my, of genocide on Myanmar getting deleted and you know having no evidence to construct how the the sequence of events happened and the same thing also with Sri Lanka and uh, perhaps it's going to be the same thing in Pakistan, India, and all the other places where Facebook has been instrumental in perpetrating hate, at least in some ways, by not moderating it. Uh, but, and this also kind of like puts me to the, uh, and I promise this is going to be the last question for this, because I know you might all be very tired. Uh, so uh, this puts me, brings me to the last question, which is uh, about the online trolls and harassing and bullying. And I am also thinking in the terms that I, at least I am not aware of any mental harassment litigation 
going against any of the tech company and which might be primarily because tech is not having a direct consumer relationship to us. But, and in, in the, uh, I, will, I will also add to it that the panel previously that we had with a uh, couple of um, people from uh, media, we actually talked about the censorship by noise. Yeah, so being censored and bullied to not speak and then having that mental harassment or that psychological effect on, on a person's person. Could this be a potential way forward also for litigations in coming years? So yeah, floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, so in Australia, we have online safety legislation that's just passed, which introduces civil penalties on platforms and individuals who abuse individuals, uh, cyber abuse or, or, or bully children as well. Um, uh, I, yeah, I just thought I would add that. I, I do think there is scope under even criminal laws to um, add some sort of liability, corporate liability for corporate participation or enablement of um, of individual harassment. We don't have that at the, that level of liability in Australia at the moment, but that's possibly something that could be considered in the future in other jurisdictions. Um, I think that the case actually isn't necessarily that difficult, particularly if you have a evolved tort jurisdiction that we do have in the consumer sphere, but we, do, uh, but we don't have in general. So it could be a regular tort case as well, right? Um, which is sort of at the very least, because, because I think it's fairly well established now that these platforms in many aspects, not in all aspects, but in many aspects are not pure intermediaries. They are editors in many, I mean, these algorithms are um, pick and choose what speech is going to go out. So there's a structural problem there and a structural problem of not adhering to their own terms of service. I think that the point that Ma has been making quite correctly and the point that the social network makes, uh, the film, the social network uh, that, you know, I, I think most of us have probably seen is uh, with regard to us being the um, product versus the consumer is slightly different from the legal point of, and should be kept distinct from whether a consumer case can be brought, right? Because I think one is a sort of more rhetorical state of who is bringing the money in and who they are beholden to versus the legal consumer relationship, which is also sort of existence you know, in India with a free clinic. I do very quickly with the chair's permission, want to um, answer my chamber colleague Utsav's question since he has asked it. Uh, yes, though, though, we could talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, correct. But very quickly, um, I think it's an important question, right? Because I think that there's, it, there's, there's a very attractive idea of the filter. And the people who are bringing this case in India are very good friends of mine, you know, um, a filter with regard to child pornography. The problem is that it's obvious. All sorts of research with, with regard to um, the issues that are being filtered, the words that are being filtered, for example, right, uh, get cut out. So not only do you not know where um, the problem is, there's another, there's the problem of the research being filtered. There's also the problem of um, the slippery slope of the filter then being used for other things. Thanks a lot, Karuna. And thanks a lot, all of you actually to be here and uh, to be part of this panel. And uh, I, I can't stress this enough that the real intention of this panel was to actually bring all of you together in one frame so that we can keep on collaborating in the future as well, taking the big tag down in our own ways, in our own jurisdictions, or perhaps forum shop across to be able to uh, do that. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot for coming for this panel and thanks to all the people who will be viewing this or are already doing this for being with us for the uh, uh, really exciting questions that they have put forward. And I look forward to seeing you all again. And we have one more day, by the way, to go for the EU India Summit. So feel free to join in if you would like to or to give us an intervention. And we will also come back to you on the advocacy front of 
how we want the diplomacy to look like. I'd love to stay in touch with everyone. So everyone who's consenting to exchange contact details. Definitely, definitely. You're all on the CC now. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, yes, I have a question about the panel. So if we could stay on uh, after for a second. Yes, sure. Yes, I haven't heard from anyone. Okay, so are you, you want to end the webinar, but still stay on? Yes, okay, sure, sure, let's do that.